consistent self-improvement, everybody. You are now listening to American Gypsy Podcast. I am your host, Classic. And I'm Gypsy. And today we have a couple of guests with us. We have uh, our co-host, Mercedes, as well. (laughs) And we have special guest, uh, Dr. Donald White, with us today. And he also goes by The Chemist. And before we get into all the amazing stuff that you're working on, um, I guess give us a little background about yourself. And it's a big pleasure to have you with us yeah, today. definitely. <laughs> we appreciate your presence. No, for sure. So uh, I hail from Richmond, California, born and raised in the heart of the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, I started out my academic career actually in Fresno. I went to junior college first. So I was at Fresno City College. Um, but from there, I went on to Tuskegee, where I became a tri-alumnus, got three degrees there, bachelor's in chemistry, master's in chemistry, and a PhD in materials. Um, got a couple of patents out of my work, out of my um, master's in PhD dissertation work. And uh, yeah, won a bunch of awards, got some recognition, and it's been pretty fruitful. Um since then, you know, I've started a lab and uh, I'm currently teaching at uh, two, two universities. So Miles College in Alabama and Texas Southern University. Nice. How old were you when you realized you wanted to be a chemist? Uh, I was pretty young. Um, so Richmond isn't really the epicenter for science. Right. Um, so I was probably elementary school. I knew I wanted to do some form of science. Um, that started out as like, uh, you know, like physical science, physical chemistry. Um, it didn't turn into like, oh, no, I want to be a chemist until um, I got into high school. So it wasn't until I got to Kennedy and I was like, oh, no, this is what I want to do. What is it about chemistry versus the other sciences? Like what got you excited um, about it? So, so for me, I've always had like a really strong affinity. Um, I, I realized early on that everything has a chemistry, everything. Mm-hmm. So there's chemistry in engineering, there's chemistry in biology, um, even in the physics, right? Um, so the physics is actual, the, the chemical, physical chemical phenomenon that we're experiencing. So everything has a chemistry and it was kind of an intimate relationship also because it almost felt like, um, so I would have this weird, all right, I'm about to tap into this dream I used to always have. I used to have this weird um, dream where, you know, I had already passed away, right? And God would be showing me all of these like profound equations and how he created all these different things. And we'd be sitting up, looking down at the earth like this, how I did this, and this, how I did that. And I'd be sitting there just asking all of these questions. And so um, I think I'm not a, a dream interpreter, but I always wanted to believe that that was, you know, the higher call and saying, Hey, this is what you're supposed to do. Right. So it happened a lot. That's actually, I haven't had that dream in a while, but um, definitely had it more than 12 times. So. Wow. Yeah. That's definitely yeah. A when sign. you say having <laughs> not in a while, what do you mean? What do you say? What do you, what do you call it? Um, it's been some years actually. Um, I've actually had it again in college uh, when I was in a PhD program, I had it a couple of times, but I haven't had it since, since I've graduated. Wow. But, yeah. She even knows I don't think that. I've ever shared that with anyone. <laughs> Appreciate you for sharing that with us. That's yeah. quite yeah. magical. I I grew up sure. having a dream of finding like money on the ground, and I wow. actually used to actually find money on the ground. And as of living in California over the past five years, about three or four years ago, we got into bearite, and I go and pick up. Ah, and okay. we found a like a nice little pocket one time. And it was this feeling, the same dopamine feeling almost felt like from the dream when like, uh, you know, oh man, it's here. Look, oh man, it's almost everywhere. And it was like that same feeling. And I could say I can't really think, I don't think I've really had the dream the same since either. Since? As far as, yeah, I don't think since having that. Yeah. It's almost like lucid, right? Um, It's almost like you're in the dream. So you can like experience the emotions and stuff like that. So yeah, I know exactly what you mean. Yeah, that's pretty wild, though. Yeah, it is. That dream is wilder than my dream. Your dream is wild. (laughs) (laughs) 
really <laughs> have to say that potentially the reason why maybe that dream hasn't occurred is because it's a new dream, right? Like you have made it to a portion of that dream already, and now you're set on to the next deviation Thanks. of whatever that is, right? Like you were finding money on the ground, Kwame. Now you found it. Now <laughs> it's what do you do with it? And uh, Dr. White, for you, I know that one of your other dreams is to be a Nobel Peace Prize recipient, yeah. right? Yes. So I wanted to speak to you a little bit about that and how you even had the courage to set out and say, I can feel myself, I can feel myself walking to the podium. I, I can envision the, the award and what you believe you may receive that award for because i think it's great when we can set goals mm -hmm. the bigger the better i i mean we're we're definitely in the presence of, of greatness so so what does that mean for okay. you to say i will be a nobel peace prize winner so um the the nobel prize is probably the most coveted award right in the world and so um it comes in different categories peace being one of them chemistry medicine, um, economics. I think there's uh, another one I'm leaving out. I think maybe physics. Mm. I'm not sure, but um, no African-American has ever won it in chemistry. Uh, we only win it in peace. And I think uh, Bishop Tutu might have won it in economics. Okay. Maybe. Or I, I, might, I might be misquoted. I'm not sure. I have to fact check that. But um, Economics and peace are the only two categories we've wanted in. We that needless to say, we haven't wanted in medicine or physics or chemistry. And so I want to be the first um, to win it in chemistry. And you know, with that being said, it's not to say that we we haven't had um scientists that have not been worthy of it. They have, absolutely. We've had a, a ton of scientists, you know, um uh, Percy L. Julian, uh, St. Elmo Brady, um, Dr. Hildreth Poindexter, um, Dr. Ernest Everett Just, the Black Apollo of Science, um, George Washington Carver. I mean, I can literally, and those are just the men. I mean, there's also a, a slew of women that I could probably just, you know, name off as well. Um, for whatever reason, we haven't we haven't uh, been able to cross that threshold, even in 2023. Right. But every year um, I find myself hoping and praying that, you know, one day I get a call from Stockholm and they say we need you in Sweden because, uh, you know, we're going to nominate you. You're going to be a laureate. So that's definitely one of my life's goals. Um, you know, so. Um, that was also a dream too, uh, a lucid dream I had some time in in undergrad. It was weird, but I, I wanted to. I knew I wanted the prize well before that, but it wasn't until I got to college and I was like, "Man, I'm gonna win this thing." Um, I don't know how yet, but I feel like I am. So, how old were you when you got your first microscope? Um, that's At least a good one question. Grade. No, I was pretty young, actually. I, I had one of those toy sets yeah. kind of early. I think uh, I had one of those toy set microscopes. Yeah, that was me early. too, about middle school. If I yeah, I, it's, I'm, I would say the same, like maybe middle school, maybe even elementary school. I, I got one pretty early. Um, I got one pretty early. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I guess even for then – you couldn't really do too much. And a lot of the chemicals I didn't even understand Did you, did you have a good idea of some of the chemicals when you were messing with that at that age, or was it only um, until like high school so, you started more learning about? No, yes and no. So, um, I did know a bit, right. But it was all, you know, household chemicals. It wasn't really, uh, so much like the, the reagent gray stuff that we use in the lab. Right. But um, I think what ended up happening was um, I got into high school and um, I had a teacher by the name of Mrs. Irvin. She taught biology, right? And uh, we were doing genetic gene splicing. So we took the gene that was inside of a, um, the firefly and we put it in bacteria, which is a pretty common occurrence now. But we 
that was like cutting edge, state of the art uh, at the time we did it, right? And I remember when our bacteria started glowing in the dark, I was like, oh yeah, this is it. I'm doing this, like mm -hmm. that's it. That was confirmation for me, like I'm so, I was still a knucklehead, but I was so hook, line, and sinker, like it's what it is. <laughs> <laughs> so what is what's the difference in the generation when it comes to the attention span of you know kids being interested in science in you know ver the, this generation well the new generation versus our generation what's the biggest difference you see versus like you know your um now? here's the thing right i think the affinity is the same meaning kids in the past and kids now right both love science. Kids love science. They don't know what scientists do. And so it never translate into them actually becoming a scientist. Right. So I think that um, they love it. They just don't know how to get into it. That's not something, especially in a black community, it's not something that's actually pushed. Right. right. So right. Um, most kids don't know even what a patent is. Right. Or, we we're gonna ask um, about that as well. Yeah, I, yeah, I wanted for to sure. Ask about that, yeah. They don't know, like you know, what a patent is or what's the difference between chemistry and biology, right? They don't know what chemists actually do. People ask me that. Adults ask me that all the time. So you're a chemist, right? I'm like, yeah. They were like, so what exactly do you do, right? Yeah. And so we kind of get that where people don't really know um, what it is that we do. We do all types of things. I mean, it's pretty broad. Yeah. Um, what are some examples of the things that you do? I'm glad you asked that. So um, I do chemical verification, right, of unknowns. So we characterize things like, say, there is a, a waste material somewhere, and they say, hey, we don't know what this is. They'll send it off to a lab, and we'll verify, oh, this is this, you have this, and we'll, we'll analyze it, break it down, and tell them what it is, how to dispose of it, what's the, you know, the effects of it physical properties um is it hazardous is it not um things like that so we also do um synthesis work so we make things right um different types of things we make crystals solid state stuff so, uh, solid materials liquids um you have food chemists who do food all different types of food products and preservatives and additives and flavors and that's a whole thing then you have cosmetic chemists who do all different types of beauty products from hair and makeup to chapsticks, to lotions, to, you know, um, soaps, you know, Perfect. anything you can think of in that realm of, of beauty. Then you have, um, <laughs> I mean, the, the, the field is pretty broad. I've done pretty much everything. You have specific water chemists. So I started out as a water chemist. I worked for a water bottling company right out of undergrad. And we did all kinds of day to day uh, water quality analysis and things of that nature. So, I mean, it's it's pretty um, a wide net that you can cast under just the one auspice of, you know, chemistry. But then there's different types of sciences as well. So, you know, um, biology is typically the living, but then there's a biochemistry. Right how chemistry affects living organisms and stuff like that. So, you know, again, um, biochemists, they, and I've, I've done a little bit of that as well, um, and environmental chemistry as well. So there are so many different aspects of what we do. Um, it's, it's really broad. Okay. Well, I got a follow-up question on that. Yeah, for sure. You had started talking a little bit about patents. And yeah. I know it's something that we had discussed in pre-production. I want to link that a little bit to the Nobel Prize because as a people, we're responsible for so many inventions and hold a plethora of patents from cell phones to sprinklers to air conditioners to traffic signals to gaming devices. Like, we don't even have enough time to discuss how many patents people of African descent hold. So when you're talking about the fact that right now you have your own patent and another patent pending, how did you get into the patent game, if you would like? 
for the people that don't know, what does it mean to have a patent and how would you encourage some people to maybe go in that direction? Sure. So, um, so first, uh, before we talk about patents, I like to discuss intellectual property. So your intellectual property is basically anything you think or come up with, right? It can be the podcast, the name of the podcast, the logo, right? The type of podcast you have. It can be a song. It can be some art. It can be an invention. That's all your IP, right? Um, so in the realm of STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, in the realm of STEM where chemistry falls under, right, you have... Um, a bunch of different types of roads you can go in for, for patents. So for me, I made a discovery in the lab that was completely serendipitous um, one late night. And I was in there working and I make um, what we call nano composites. So a nano composite is basically um, we use a nano material, which is really is a scientific term to say really, really small. So uh, one, one billionth, um, is the size, right? One billionth of a meter is a nanometer. So um, we're talking about something really small and we incorporate these things into uh, plastics, right? So I was making um, nanoplastics or nanocomposites. And um, one of the things we learned is that by incorporating my uh, nanoparticles into the nanocomposite, into the composite, um, we it caused biodegradation of the plastic. So I made a biode uh, biodegradable plastic, but it wasn't just one plastic. It was, we were able to incorporate our nanomaterial into all of these different synthetic plastics and they biodegrade. So we went for a patent because we want to protect the intellectual property. So we go through the U.S. Uh, patent and trademark office and we say, hey, we have an invention and we, we want your protection, right? So we're the first people to do this. And so you submit in a patent application and it goes through the rigor to see if anybody else had done it and see if it's sound and all of that kind of stuff. And then, you know, it's a pretty lengthy process. It took us a couple of years, but then they award the patent afterwards. They say, well, you're, these are your claims that you made. Nobody else has done this. This is where we at. Boom. You got it. And the patent is awarded. It comes out as a publication and, um, like I was trying to, uh, like I was trying to tell uh, a colleague of mine, one patent is like ten publications because during that patent process you can't publish any of the work because anybody can just take it, right? Mm -hmm. So um, you got to kind of hold it close, uh, close to your vest while you're going through the patent process. So, you know, um, so I'm an inventor of a facile method of incorporating nanocellulose into um, plastics to make them biodegrade. That's amazing. And it's, it's only plastic though, huh? Well, yeah. So there's all different types. So plastics are a family of chemicals, right? So um, they're, they're a family of polymers. So the polymer is a scientific term that just means poly as in multiple, and it's just repeat units, right? Repeat units. And so these repeat units makes the plastic strong, um, typically lightweight, cheap, easy to make. And um, yeah, so they make these things, but they don't break down. And so that life cycle analysis is, okay, so now we have this product that's really good. We, you know, we can put our ketchup in there and our mustard in there. And if we drop it at the, at the family barbecue, we're not going to break it and lose the ketchup and the mustard, right? But at the, at the end of life, it finds itself in a landfill, in a waterway, in the ocean, um, you know, and it's in the environment and it has an environmental impact. So that environmental impact is what we're trying to mitigate. So at the end of life, we're looking at the end of life perspective for our products that we make. So at the end of life, what can we do with this? So at the end of life, let it biodegrade naturally, like our paper products, Yeah, you know? And so that was that was definitely one of the goals. And we did a myriad of biodegradation studies, soil, biogas, et cetera. And um, we got some really, really good data and we were able to secure a patent from it. 
That's nice. amazing. I actually worked on the PTAB um, application. I don't know if that's what you use to file. Oh, really? Up. Yeah. Um, that's pretty cool. I do web development. I ended up working at USPTO a few years back, and that was the project that I worked on. That's pretty good. That's pretty cool. <laughs> So you're a computer scientist or? Yeah. Oh, okay. That's dope. So you're in STEM? Yeah. That's STEM. Definitely. <laughs> Actually, my whole family is in, is in that. So it's I have cool. four siblings that are into it as well. Which is really rare because we only make up about anywhere from 9 to 12% of the field African-Americans do. Yeah. I, I know most of my classes, I was the only, um, usually the only black person and usually the only female. <laughs> and they count you twice. You're a double minority black woman. Yeah. yeah. And now I look at the same school and it's a lot more diversity. So it's good. That's in, good. In, in the, in the computer science program and all of that. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. I think, uh, the national science foundation is doing a really good job of trying to get like some notoriety to the disparities there. Um, yeah you know, and putting out the grants to try to like recruit people and get them into the STEM fields. We, um, that's how I got into like the STEM education side of what we do, right? Mm -hmm. Where we're actually trying to um, get more people that look like us into the field. Um, I don't really think people understand how lucrative it can be um, or how lucrative it actually is. Um, I try to tell kids all the time, like, you know, who you think makes more money, the top NBA basketball player or, you know, an average scientist. And they say, NBA, of course. And I laugh at them every time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I laugh at them every time because yeah. I actually met um, some scientists up in Indiana, um, three chemists and a biologist. And they, you know, was taking me around and, um, showing me their facilities and stuff. It's their company. It's called Heritage. And they incorporated a polymer into asphalt, which when it gets wet, it reduces or increases friction and, and it reduced road fatalities. So um, it made the roads less slick, but only when it gets wet, right? And so um, it actually helps slow cars down. So then, so then, this company um, is called Heritage. There's like twenty nine and a half billion dollars a year mm. making asphalt. <laughs> yeah. Right. Mm. So now if you look at the owner of the Dallas Mavericks, Mark Cuban, his net worth is five billion dollars. They make six times that annually. So you've never even heard of these guys before today. Yeah. And this is what I try to get the kids to understand. Like you've heard of Mark Cuban and you've heard of, you know, Luka Doncic and all these different play people that play, you know, for the Dallas Mavericks. But I just told you, I met three chemists that can buy Mark Cuban six times over every year. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so um, that's one innovation. They had another one that was like fetching them six billion a year or something this company called micronutrients absolutely ridiculous i mean i mean these guys are making a lot of money there's a bunch of success stories like that too, and you've never heard of it never heard of the scientists there's a lot of money here yeah, yeah. that's important to highlight that because sometimes that's what motivates a lot of kids to get into a certain yeah. industry oh it makes money let me look into it a little bit more and they realize they love it yeah speaking of kids you have a yeah. book um is it a kid's book? Yeah, I want to get into chemistry? your book series. I know you have a few upcoming. Here, let me so. uh, see if I can get the, here, I'll take it off. Yeah, what inspired you to do a book? So I was in graduate school and we were running a program called Science on Saturdays. Um, we were running a program called Science on Saturdays. And so... I was doing um, basically outreach science projects and science uh, experiments and stuff with kids, right? And I was a starving student and I was broke and I was trying to figure out a way to supplement the money I was paying on, you know, 
various experiments and stuff like that. So I was going to elementary schools. I was going to middle schools, high schools, just going around while I was in uh, graduate school and talking to the kids and interacting with them and teaching them what type of science I do and teach them about nanochemistry and all that good stuff. Right. And so I was like, oh, I need to write a book. Uh oh. I was like, sorry about that. <laughs> I was like, I need to write a book. I need to write this book. And um, and I can sell this book and it'll help me pay for my chemicals and blah, blah, blah. And so as I got into it, I couldn't do anything halfway. So I started getting into it and into it. And then it started out and looked like a pamphlet at first. And I was like, ah, I don't like the way that looks. I want a, a real book. And so I looked and I made it hard back. And then, you know, um, so I got into this book and the first, it's the first book in a series and it was made to supplement, um, it was made to supplement all of the different things that I was already doing, right? And so it's geared, it's a true K through 12 book. Now, I don't tell the kids this until after they do the experiments in the book, but it's a college level book. So I wrote it just like I would write a college level experiment. So they go through and they work through and they do it. And then I say, hey, you guys just done, you know, like the first year or a second year college level um, lab. And they're like, what? And I'm like, yeah. So. The name of the book is called Your Chemist 2. The first book in the series is on water. But I don't know if you can see this little card. I got a couple of more books coming. Got a couple more books coming. So there's one on polymers. And there's also one on uh, cosmetics and one on food. So the one that's on cosmetics is called She's a Chemist 2 kind of stereotypical there, but um, it's kind of geared around getting young black girls or just girls in general into STEM, yeah. you know, just getting them into the chemistry and into the science. And so, um, so this, this is the first book in a, in a four book series. Maybe there'll be more books after that, but this is the first book in a four book series. Um, all the experiments in there are water experiments, I break down every single one. So it's narrated by my character, the chemist here. I'll show it to you. It's actually narrated by this uh, cartoon character that I came up with. And his trusty sidekick. Donna Proton. <laughs> chemist and Donna Proton. So um, it shows them every aspect. So in here, you know, I teach him how to write a lab report. I teach him how to read and make and take proper measurements. Um, you know, so there's crossword puzzles in there, word search. There's a glossary where I don't dumb anything down. I actually set the bar and I want the kids to actually, you know, yeah. meet the bar, but they can work through the book themselves. The glossary will define and break down all of the words that's used here. They're bolded and they can, you know, find the words, look them up, and then they kind of have them. And so here I can show you that. So, you know, it, it's a it's a nice whole little setup, you know. And I definitely um, looking forward it, to taking a look at it. Yeah, definitely. It's is geared towards building their chemical vocabulary, but you know, there's some facts about water in there, different nomenclature things. So the goal is to actually get them to, you know, develop um, their scientific acumen. So that's the whole goal. So tell us a little bit about water. Ah, what do you want to know? So even, a really even the crow. right the percentage of it as far as in our body. Do you, ah, so the body is about seventy five to eighty percent water, right? Right. So. Let me let me start by saying this. I started this with water because it is one of the most interesting <laughs> molecules. Right. Yeah. So everything has what we call a water standard. Right. So if you look at converting um, Fahrenheit to Celsius, 
there's a number in there, 32, right? That 32 is the actual freezing point of water, the conversion. Mm -hmm. If you think about food, right? A calorie, the definition of a calorie is the amount of energy it takes to heat up one gram of water by one degree Celsius. Mm -hmm. That's the definition of a calorie, right? So you say, I ate this meal and it's like, whew, that was 80 calories or 200 calories right there. To convert that, you're saying that 80 calories, I can heat up 80 grams of water by one degree Celsius. That's how much energy was in that food, right? So everything has a water standard. Earth is 80% water, 75 to 80%, right? So we have um, these really unique properties um, chemically about water, the bond angles, right? It has this really unique bent shape to it. And that allows it to bond not only the oxygen and the two hydrogens, but it also allows it to bond with other water molecules. And it forms these really unique matrices, right? So we call that hydrogen bonding. But then it's almost like it's alive, right? The water is almost like it's alive. It has behavior. Okay. Before we continue, I'm, I'm going to hold that yeah. idea. We're going to take a short little break real quick. All right, cool. And then we're going to come back and we're going to start. But yes, I definitely want to talk about that as far yeah, as. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And, it's and, interesting. Okay. We're going to take a little break and come right back. I guess um, before we went on break, we were talking about the behavior of water. The life of water. Yeah. I was totally alive. Uh, edu educate uh -huh. us a little bit on that. Yeah, so. Um, there's something called uh, self-assembly. It's a phenomenon that we um, we talk about sometime in chemistry where you get an arrangement of atoms, of molecules, right? Mm -hmm. And they begin to self-assemble into these really unique structures. And we've studied this, but we don't really know exactly why they do that. We know how they do it, right? And, you know, it's through covalent and, uh, and, and intermolecular forces like uh, hydrogen bonding, right? So we know that they can use, so a hydrogen bond is a lone pair of electrons, right? Some electrons who form a temporary hold on a, a neighboring hydrogen. Mm -hmm. And so um, inside the two bonds that's holding, so there's an oxygen, right? And then there's two hydrogen. So inside that, actually, I think I have a, picture of that in my book. Hold on one second. That might actually help. So what we have here, what you see here in the red is the oxygen. And what you see in the white are the two balls in the white. They're the two, they represent the two hydrogen. And if you look at the shape of that, it almost kind of looks like it's bent, right? And what makes that unique is what happens and what you don't see is what makes up the two bonds are electrons. They're negatively charged. On top of the oxygen, there's two free electrons that are not bonded to anything, and they're also negative. And so they repel, forming this little bent shape. They come down, right? They repel the two hydrogens because they're in they're bonded, right? And so the, the electrons in the bond are now pushed down into this triangular, what we call bent. Now, that exposes the electrons sitting on top. The beauty in that is they're now available to bond and connect to other stuff. What we, what we, what we see, what we see is when that happens, we actually see a uh, self-assembly behavior. So I don't know if you've actually seen that experiment where people say different affirmations, to words, negative, like, yeah. positive, you, positive, like that into yeah. the water the and then freeze water, it. Yeah. And then it completely changes the crystal structure. Wait, yeah. now right. I didn't get the freezing part. We yeah, only they, saw it to they where the they ice. let it... Um, like it decayed, one decayed a lot faster than the other. But no, I don't know. Oh, is that the, like food? the little icicles 
and the shape of it. I think it was rice water, it. the experiment they did. Ah, uh, okay. I got you. Yeah, the rice so, water. So one of the things that's really unique, right, is that I've also experienced that in the lab. Whereas with one of my patents, there's something that we call, um, and I'm going to get into the definition of it. It's called chiral pneumatic alignment. I'm going to take a step back. Okay, so when we make these nano composites, remember the nano is really small and the composites is just, you know, the composition of the two, one polymer mixing with the other polymer, right? So when we make these two composites and we marry them together, they have to be um, compatible, right? Mm -hmm. They have to be physically and chemically compatible or else you'll have adhesion issues and you'll, you'll get failure, right, on, on a plastic, which is no good. So now in our process, one of the things we do is we, we, we go through a process called freeze drying or lyophilization. So now here's, here's what we do. We take water and we suspend our nanoparticles in the water, right? And I take it and I put it in a negative 80 freezer and I freeze it overnight. So it's rock solid. Then I put it on a freeze dryer or a lyophilizer, and it takes it from the solid phase to the gas phase without going through the liquid phase. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it goes from a solid freeze to a dryer. gas, right? Water vapor. It evaporates off and it gets sucked out. And what I'm left with is a dry nanoparticle. In that process, because we're under vacuum, we're under pressure, right? And in that environment what happens is is what we call chiral pneumatic alignment it causes my nanoparticles to form these crystals and they stack on top of each other in perfect symmetry and align and i was seeing it and didn't know like what is happening here what is happening here and i found a paper talking about this phenomenon and it has everything to do with the water it has nothing to do with the nanoparticle itself mm. so the water arranges the particles inside that are suspended for a period of time in there. And when you freeze it, they get stuck. And then when you freeze dry it, they keep that symmetry in the nanoparticle form. And it, 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 it allows us to actually add it inside of the plastics. And it was a whole thing. And we didn't even know what was happening. And one day I was doing some analysis and caught it like, what is this? And then I had to dive a little bit deeper because I had no understanding of it. And then I started doing some experiments regarding to that. And I was like, wow, this is crazy. And we really need to publish it. But we were going for a patent and I hadn't patented it. So you guys are the first ones to even hear about it, actually. Wow. So you published this yeah. before we released this episode. That's what you're saying. We, we we haven't even written it up to publish it. We but got the is, is it okay well, to release this episode? Right. Oh yeah, it is. Yeah. We need to worry about that. Okay, <laughs> <Because> <laughs> we've yeah, had that happen before. Where yeah, yeah, my once permission. it's out there, it's out there. So it's that's in the, the patent. Thing. It's it's okay. in the patent already. So some of it is in the patent, but we haven't mm -hmm. done it as an actual paper. If All that right. makes sense. So yeah, it's so. not. It's not. It, well, of course, it's not artificial intelligence. What would you call it? It's like. Uh, uh, organic intelligence, or you know, for I would call it intelligence. Intelligence. Yeah, uh, it's intelligence. yeah. Just. We don't. We don't really look at um, the chemicals uh, being alive, right? Yeah. So there was a celebrity. I won't say the name because I know it's a, sen a sensitive subject. But there was a celebrity who had overdosed, and I was talking to. Uh, one of my mentors, who's also a chemist, and he looked at me, he said, Donald, they don't respect the chemicals. And so therefore, they fell victim. Mm -hmm. And so there has to be a healthy respect. Like when you go into the woods, you know that there's bears and tigers and, you know, animals out there, wolves that could kill you. Right. So there's a respect that there's dangerous things out there. Some people believe that the chemicals are dangerous, but they don't really understand the dynamic of what that danger looks like. 
right? They, they're not really understanding. They're looking at this thing as an inanimate object. I'm saying that <clears throat> there's a really intimate um, experience where you're in the lab all of the time. You start to see the chemicals almost as if they're alive. And then you end up, you know, experiencing them in a different way because you're observing them and they have behavior mm -hmm. the, the chemicals actually have behavior. They do certain things under certain conditions, just like people. And so when you look at it like that, you say, well, maybe I am dealing with an intelligence here. I'm glad you said that. I, I, I've got a pregunta on that to, to throw Kwame out there because he's working on Spanish. So pregunta is question. <laughs> um, I got a question about what you said in relation to people and, and chemistry, because a lot of times you'll hear the phrase like we have chemistry. Um, and I know we talked about pheromones and even earlier, I was saying to Kwame and Luam, like, it feels different to not be in the studio with you guys. I'm here remotely. I don't right. feel the same way that right. I feel when I'm around you guys that I do right now from home. So for people who are interested in the chemistry of, like, physical interaction, yep. you know, talk to us a little bit about that. Oh, yeah. So, look, <clears throat> really cool. I'm, I'm so glad you said that. So every single molecule in the body is giving off light and sound at some frequency. Mm -hmm. Every single molecule, right? So now, what does that actually mean? I, you probably heard before that 90% of communication is nonverbal, right? So some of the things that um, we experience in our everyday life are purely chemical. So a good, good example of that. We, we use deodorants, soaps, and scents to mask our natural body odor, right? But our body odor changes when a person is sick. It mm -hmm. also, I've seen some studies where the body odor and the body chemistry can change based on mood, based on diet. So now what we are masking is a whole nother level of communication. Mm -hmm. So when you look at other mammalians like dogs or cats, right? They smell each other's scents. And what, what we're um, understanding is they're picking up so much information about the dog or the cat that they never even come in contact with just by the markings that they've left behind. So it's the same with people. As we talk, we're taking our, our brain chemistry is moving, right? And it's formulating words and sounds in real time. Those things are actually interacting with our body chemistry and we're perceiving them a certain kind of way. But if you're in the room with a person, there's now other things, indicators, and, you know, there could be some things like uh, cortisol. Can you, ex can, can you experience that? You're the person that you're sitting next to is stressed, right? Oh, you, you seem stressed or, oh, you seem down, right? So there's other things. Maybe it's not even the facial expression. People say, oh, I feel your energy. How do we know that you don't actually smell and interpret in the mind their chemistry? 90% of communication is nonverbal. So, yeah, it's kind of hard to get that that energy that, that you speak of energetically or, or chemically or biochemically from afar. You can't get it. So now our interaction is solely through the screen artificially. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I would agree with you wholeheartedly. I think that um, that's definitely, you know, it, it changes the dynamic of an interview. So you can't really get that. And people use that word chemistry loosely, but I think you're spot on, right? Mm -hmm. You can't really get that same chemistry um, artificially. What's your experience working with crystals? Oh, which types? So, um, so there's, are you talking about like, um, halite and, um, you know, things that you find like earth crystals Yeah, earth or like, okay. So like, like, like we, we, um, actually go and find barite crystal here in Southern California. Okay. You familiar with barite? 
I am. Okay. I am. Yeah. So, um, so I used to work for an oil and gas company and a lot of things we did, we, you know, we dug, dug in the ground pretty deep yeah. and we pull out all of these different, you know, crystals and, uh, uh, in chemistry, we call them salts. So group one and group two elements form salts. It's not just like sodium chloride, halite, like table salt, but it's all different types of salts, right? Um, crystals have energy. They have properties. Um, we learned that in inorganic chemistry. And so um, I think that, uh, you know, I've seen people actually put them in the sun and try to uh, charge them up. Mm-hmm. I, I think there's some merit in there in, in doing that. Um, I've also seen uh, a bunch of different uh, what, what we would call dogma, I guess, if you will. But I think that we probably need to put some of this stuff under scientific scrutiny, I think we'd be surprised with what we find um, with, you know, some of the properties of these crystals. People over the years have, over the eons actually have believed that these things have healing properties and all kinds of um, properties to, to raise um, awareness and, you know, spirit. And so I think that that, that kind of thing needs to actually be looked at. So, yeah, no, I'm, all, I'm here for that. <laughs> That's actually not what we thought you would um, highlight about it because usually, yeah. um, you know, they don't talk about the metaphysical properties in in the science uh, community. <laughs> it's usually like Paseo electricity or like we have it on the phone or cobalt or stuff like that. Of but it's, it's nice that you highlight there's some merit to some of the, yeah. I guess, other properties. When it comes to to like formation, um, from our experience over the past few years, you know, we've found some that formed a certain way, and then mm-hmm. we've found some that have just formed almost perfectly, whether it's a point on it or what are right. some of the what changes some of the um, or what are some of the um, I guess things that so. When you talk about crystal formation, there's a couple of things that come into play. Surface area, so how much surface can they grow? Okay. And then, you know, like, the directions and stuff. So that's one. And then pressure and temperature. So those two things are inversely proportional to one another. So, like, um, if I raise the pressure, then I can lower the temperature at which something can, you know, um, what do they call it? Aggregate, right? Or nucleate if you will, when we talk about forming these crystals, right? Um, so the depth at which you found them, are they 10 feet? Are they 20 feet deep? You now know? we're on the, uh, we're on the shore for these. Oh, so this is all Coastline. surface level stuff. Oh, okay. Yeah. So they, but that's not Wait, to say that. But they, the, right. We're on the right, cliff. That's not to say that they weren't the cliff actually is, made. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. So here's the thing. It really just depends on the condition in which they were grown. Right. So it's just like um, it's, it's just like anything. If you take a flower and you put it inside a small pot or, you know, some kind of vine or something, you put it inside a small pot, it won't grow. But then you put it, you change the conditions, you put it in soil in the ground and it's like, man, this thing really took um, crystals are the same way. Right. Um, that's a whole field of chemistry. Crystallists, they get paid really well. Wow. But okay. not just size. Um, some of the like we f- we find some barite and one looks completely different from the other. Like one My has color, just the, you know, like the crystal formation itself will look completely different. And I've seen that with a few other minerals as well. It could be some impurities in there. So like um, impurities change color. Uh, It will change the color of a thing. It'll change the clarity. It'll change, um, you know, the overall structure. Again, that's a whole field of chemistry. I think, um, what is it? Uh, Front, center, cubic, FCC and BCC, all these different crystal ladder structures and stuff like that. Um, body, body center cubit and front center cubit and all of these different things where, you know, you can have atoms forming in certain geometrical shapes and have atoms in the middle. And we try to spatially, um, represent these things, um, in chemistry and kind of like show it. So, um, there's so many different reasons why you can be seeing color variations. It could be impurities. 
It could be um, the way the crystal grew and is bending light a certain kind of way and changing the wavelengths, right? So now the light is going through at a certain angle and coming out. So you, you're actually seeing the opposite reflection. So if it's blue, then that means that, you know, it's it's absorbing red, right? And so that's the electromagnetic chemical phenomenon there. So, you know, it's the opposite end of the spectrum type of thing. So it could be any one of those things. You know what I'm saying? It could be any one of those things that causes that. So are you going to do a crystal book in the future as well? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Kids are kids are too. Kids are, yeah, <laughs> rocks, at least rocks and minerals. Maybe not crystal, but yeah, minerals. I guess. I <laughs> You're yeah. in too. Minerals. That would be cool, actually. Yeah, we, we whole- actually. I use um, muriatic acid and iron out to clean okay. the crystals that we find. Yeah, so that's my joy of almost feeling like a chemist when I put on the mask oh, and put the real. goggles on, and yeah. So that's the um, over-the-counter version. I think that's the hydrochloric acid, if I'm not mistaken. Mm-hmm. Acid. Yeah. Yeah. Be careful with that. I do. Yeah. yeah like I said, <laughs> yeah. the whole, the whole <laughs> suit, the whole, I put the mask on, the, the goggles, and, you know, Rockhound buddies would be like, ah, oh, you got the whole suit on. It's like, hey, man, I'm not playing with this stuff. Hey. <laughs> hey, sorry. I was like, I don't, not at all. Yeah. So, I guess another question. Um, I don't know if it's really dealing with chemistry, but gray, gray hair. Ah, the, gray hair. Gray hairs. So, of course, you know, it's natural to gray. Yeah, <laughs> it's natural to gray. So even yeah. when the when somebody grows a gray hair and it turns back black, is that? I got some of those too. Yeah. Yeah, it's um, it's just stress, right? So, uh, so you would say. My- Grades Thank usually you. have to do with stress. Well, not or physical trigger. stress, right? I'm talking about stress of that individual hair, right? So okay. sometimes you'll see people where um, they'll be completely dark and then their hair, their hair will gray um, as they grow it out. You know, you have to create pigment for the entire strand all the way through. Okay. Um, sometimes, so here's a really good thing. Um, there was a professor of mine, she, uh, w- when I was an undergrad, she went to, um, where did she go? She went to Egypt, to Aswit University in Egypt, and um, she was there for a period of time. And the diet, the diet there, that Mediterranean diet, she came back, she went completely great. When she came back, her hair was black again. And I was like, oh, you dyed your hair? She was like, no, I didn't dye my hair. And I was like, man, what the... But it was the food that she was eating in the region of Africa she was in. You know, she was in Northeast Africa and, you know, her hair started turning back black. It was, man. Okay, my next question, the formula of youth, how close are we to that? (laughs) So, listen, you want to know the truth? Yes. I love the truth. Okay. So, what do you think your wildest dreams are in STEM? Like in science, like your wildest dreams, like just the most craziest thing you can probably conjure up. We're probably 250 to 300 years past that. Mm -hmm. Whatever your wildest dream is, we're probably 250 to 300 years past that. I don't know Hollywood is that sounds about throwing right. out some <laughs> some crazy stuff, so we are imagining. Yeah. Some- and I would say that you just blew his mind with the Mediterranean thing because we had a debate about this a couple of podcasts ago. <laughs> more about, about the diet, you know, the Mediterranean uh, diet, about gray hair and age and how how it comes about or, or whatever. That that stay tuned to our podcast and you'll hear. This I will. Thing. So it's cool to have a scientist confirm that. I just put on my glasses because I'm about to go real, real scientist y. <laughs> All right, cool. <laughs> Need to go grab my lab coat. <laughs> yeah, I have to just jump in there real quick um, because I, I saw the periodic table at, mm-hmm. at the top of the book um, yeah. down the proton and the, and the chemist. And I, and I wanted to jump back really quick to just not only the book, but the passion that you had around even getting into this field because one of the things that I really try to tap into with young people is 
discovering your passion and then going after it, you know, and I think that as a group, we all have really tapped into what we love to do. We've picked it up, we've put sure. it down, but we've all just said, hey, regardless of whatever the fallout is going to be, it might not be economically feasible, but this is what we love and we're going to pursue it. And so when you're talking to young people and you say you love science, that's only one one part of it. Because from a personal testimony, I was a young person that loved science, but Me I was too. discouraged yeah I'm pursuing it yeah you know i was told that it wasn't for me or it was going to be too hard or the math was too long or you know it would be too expensive and that was contrary to everything i knew because coming up i was taught that my people built the pyramids i mm -hmm. was taught about all of the patents that existed i i was taught that we are the lifeblood of all of that innovation and so when you and I had that talk about research institutions and how you had to name the degree in order to even be competitive, it really let me know, like, as far as we've come, right. we still have a long way to go. And so I yeah. really wanted to take a moment. And that's why I have Tuskegee in the background, not Love because it. I graduated from there, but because here we are in 2023, knowing what happened with the Tuskegee experiment but still coming up against all of these different issues that push our people away from pursuing something that really is their heritage or their natural birthright. And so I really wanted to find out as a kid from Richmond and, yeah. and, and, and we know what Richmond is like, you know what I'm saying? Right. And I don't think that you have gone in on how, much of a success you are considering all of the barriers that and obstacles that may have been put in your place as a young black man coming from richmond and being a bachelor recipient a master's recipient you're a doctor on top of the fact that you have all these other things going on it's great to be humble but just talking about how much you've had to go through to get where you are and where you see the future for science it's, it's really so many questions in one what you've had yeah, so no, far, sure. what you see the future and then lastly how can we encourage and ensure that our young people are pursuing this path because it's, it's necessary for our survival that's just point blank period i'm so glad you said it's necessary for our survival because it really is um okay that that was a lot um but thank you for that, because I think it brought us back to um, it definitely took me back. So let, let me just go back to the book for a second. You're a chemist, too. Why did I name this book this? This was this is not me saying, oh, I'm a chemist and then you can be one, too. Mm -hmm. This was a daily affirmation that I had to tell myself. Mm -hmm. Donald, you're a chemist, too. Donald, you they ain't special. Donald, you can do this as well. Um, the science is universal. The math is universal. The chemistry is universal. Donald, you're a chemist too. And so I named the book that because this is literally something I had to tell myself. So um, I've done research at Johns Hopkins. I've done it at, you know, Georgia Tech, University of Wisconsin, Illinois. We've I've worked with all of these schools, right? Uh, Minnesota and stuff. So it was tough going into these institutions and these labs and seeing their hall of Nobel laureates. Each school I named got 20 plus, right? People in their chemistry department that have won the Nobel Prize. And going there and dealing with, um, you know, the fact that a lot of times that I was there was only because I was the token black person. Mm. Right. And <clears throat> at my time, I, I, I got uh, my Ph.D. I was working in a center of excellence funded by the National Science Foundation. It was the Center for Sustainable Nanotechnology. And a lot of times people do things that are um, inherently racist that they don't even realize is racist at the time. They you know, because that's how deep. 
Um, that's how deep we are into this systemic racist American culture that it has leached into every other facet of life, even science. So now when you see um, me here as Dr. White, that's where the passion actually comes from. Because when I look to my left and I look to my right, there wasn't anybody that looked like me trying to do any of the things. And so in Richmond, it was not okay to be like, I'm, you know, I'm gonna be a scientist. You know, those types of things get, you know, being a nerd kind of gets laughed at and joked about, right? Um, so a lot of what I was and a lot of what I was doing was being suppressed. I was suppressing everything. I didn't want to tell my friends that this is what I wanted to do because here come the jokes. Um, and so I, I didn't. And so a lot of the things that I, I did from, you know, my peers standpoint was everything they was doing. We smoking, we smoking, we drinking, we drinking, we hanging out, we hanging out. Right. We go into a party, we hollering at a female, whatever it is that we doing, that's what we doing. Right. And so it was more of that than it was, uh, you know, anything productive. It wasn't until I left, I had to leave for it to become productive uh, for me. Um, so that's kind of how I got to where we are. Um, that's kind of how I got to where we are right now. And then when I got into graduate school, it was so incredibly difficult. I had to work, even though I was at a black college, but because I was participating in a center, I had to work 10 times as hard because we were the black, we were the color, right? In the center to show that um, they were being diverse. So I had to work 10 times as hard as all of my other counterparts, all of the other student scientists in the group. It was tough. They looked at us a certain kind of way. Um, you know, you had to outperform everyone. It was tough. It was tough. Um, so I, I, my my hope is, is that that translates to ignite the fire in some young black scientists to say, you know, I'm going to do this. I don't even care. He did it. I'm going to do it. If it ain't nothing more than that, like I'm whatever, I'm going to just do it just because he did it. I'm cool with that. Just, you know, just come. We need, we absolutely need the help. We drowning out here. So that's, that's one. What we're seeing, where do I see the science going? The science is quantum leaping every two years. Every two years, it is quantum leaping. Now you incorporate data analytics software like R, and you incorporate artificial intelligence, now you can go back into the literature of the millions upon millions of publications and just pull data from all of these decades and eons of, you know, repositories of data that you can just pull now. And what they're doing is, is that they're discovering new drugs and new medicines and new everything based on old experiments that you would have never had the opportunity to go in and pull out of the data. The limit was, I only know what's going on based on what I can read. I can only read so much, but now I can go into a database and scour 20,000 papers in a day. So now all of these institutions doing research, the, the science is quantum leaping every year, every like one to two years. And I'm gonna be honest with you, we're getting left behind. We're getting left behind. You would say uh -huh. as far as more in America, we're being left behind, or do you feel like there's a very strong globally. community globally? We're getting left behind globally. Okay. Right now, so let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. Do you recall when Trump was in office and he went out there and was like, oh, we're going to build a space force. It's going to be a, like it's going to be a military force, but for space. And everybody laughed and joked at him. Right. Yeah. They, they laughed at that. All the scientists was like, we need to hurry up. 
all of these space programs at these universities just started popping up. You guys never even knew about it. They they get new curriculum every single year for space exploration. Right. That's just on the educational side. Then space business, space agriculture, space water, space mining, all of these things now come to the forefront. We still laughing at the fact that this man said Space Force. But since he said that, there are like nine new branches of the military all under Space Force. Yeah. That was only like five years ago, six years ago. That's what I'm talking about. We being left behind. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? We're being left completely behind. You got people that haven't even flown from one end of the country to the next, let alone talking about leaving the planet. Right. Mm -hmm. So now where are we? Right. Where are we? What, what's going on? We're distracted. Yeah, completely. Yeah. And while I think Nas have maybe the most prolific quote I've ever heard a rapper that was so conscious I mean, he should have won a Pulitzer, but just saying this, he said, uh, excuse my length, my, my French, but. Can, they, can I guess it really quick? Yeah, go ahead. I'm wrong. I'm wrong. Go ahead. He's playing PlayStations. They building space stations on, on Mars. Mars. Plotting civilizations. Stations. Yes, I knew it. Yeah. <laughs> Ninjas is playing PlayStation. They building space stations. On Mars, plotting civilizations. Yeah. I mean, where are we at? Where are we at? We're not even talking about the medicine and the food and where where that's going. We're not even talking about that. We're not even in the game. Scientifically, black people, we're not in the game. Everybody trying to get some money and we going digital currency. We're not even in the game. You understand what I'm saying? We're going to let some math, some simple math, hold us back and some basic reading hold us back. We're not even in the game. The math ain't that hard. I don't care how high you go. I done took every math, almost just about every math. Linear algebra, differential equations, you know, uh, all of the calculus. I mean, it doesn't. I was afraid of the math at first. I didn't took them all. It's nothing. The, 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 the fact that a matter is, it's like. You're adding, subtracting, multiplying, dividing at every level. It's the same. Like, you ain't nothing changed. It's all mental. You know what I'm saying? Because I, I can be a testimony. Like, I used to be scared of math, and I used to stay away yeah. from it in high school. But in computer science and college, they make you take a lot of math. And it, it, it took me some time to get over my mental blocks. But once I did, I realized. That was just me holding myself back. It's actually yeah. pretty simple if you just keep, you know, yeah. it it and, just, and, all yeah. of it builds. It ain't nothing but a process. Yeah. And so you, you're a computer science major. It ain't nothing but a process. You know, whatever uh, computer science language you learn, whether it be C++ or Fortran, Fortran kind of old, mm -hmm. or Python or Java, you know, whatever it is. Um, what's that? What's that one? Uh that they using on uh Max now, I forgot. But Objective C or I can't remember. It might be Python, maybe. I, I know, know in the medical and uh labs they use I think Python a lot more. Python, yeah. yeah. Which the fundamental basis of Python is C. Mm -hmm. They just languages, it's not it's all if f statements and Wiley loops and I mean it ain't really nothing. It's just a language, chemistry, a language, biology, a language, science, a language. That's all it is. And so we're we're not speaking the language. And so what happens is, is that we get left behind on the technology. You know what I'm saying? Like we're getting absolutely left behind on the technology. Like right now they're getting ready to start using DNA for, you know, data storage. Yeah. You know, they're doing all types of things like, you know, um, can I jump in real quick on yeah, of the course. kind of piece <laughs> or not? Because it really isn't, but related to CO, back to this periodic table. Mm -hmm. um, can we talk a little bit about cobalt? Cobalt. Yeah, mm -hmm. black mud. Yeah. 
the black mud. Yeah, cobalt. So, mm -hmm. I mean, cobalt is really uh, a really cool metal. It it has um some some real good electronic properties, right? So, we use it in most electronic devices. And where does it come from? Oh, it's predominantly coming out of Africa. Most mm -hmm. of the minerals come out of Africa. Right. Yeah. And it is being used to power not just our cell phones, but all electric electronic vehicles, devices. All electronic. You know what I mean? Electric yeah. cars. Uh, all electronic devices. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Black mud. That's what they call it. But that, well, that's what they call it on the continent, at least in Africa. Mm. I know and there's. So, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. No, nah, go ahead. No, I was going to say that I know there's no one answer, but what are some of the steps like towards trying to, um, you know, fill in that gap? In On some of the disparities that we're facing? The chemists to, uh, you know, to, yeah, to get more chemists so down here. In the, in the, the reason next. why we have like an economic problem, this is a hand in glove situation right here, right? The reason why we're disproportionately more poor than other nationalities, we're not in STEM. You put them in STEM, I'll show you the bag. It's that simple. The money is absolutely everywhere. You know how many times I've heard in the last couple of years, oh, you a chemist? I need a chemist. <laughs> yeah, sounds you understand what right. I'm saying? Yeah. The money is everywhere. There's a shortage on talent. I can show you the bag. You know, normally when I go talk to kids, first thing I do is pull out, huh, you see this? 20,000, 30,000. Y'all see that? Because they're accustomed to rappers and football players and basketball players doing that. So now I got to show them that scientists got that too. It's play money, right? It's not even, we don't even consider that money. Like Jay-Z said, that's, you know, y'all putting money to the ear. It's a disconnect. We don't call that money over here. Right. It's not money. This is, you know, this is not real. Y'all think this is real. This is paper. This is nothing. And so, you know, to get more black kids in science, we have to somehow educate the parents that this is what they need to do. Mm. You'll put little Johnny or um, little Ray Ray in football on saturday but you won't put him in a science stem camp on saturday yeah you know what i'm saying you can see the millions from football and basketball and even baseball we're not going into baseball like we were but you can't see it in, in stem you can't see it in science it's just hard it just don't seem you go to school all them years i don't understand you know but if I can cajole more people to convert them to come and get into the game. We need to just get into the game. I just need to get them in there. And then once I get them in the game, we can coach them. You know what I'm saying? And get them to play better. We just got to get them in the game. We're not even in the game, black people. Like when it comes to this STEM, this science game, we're not even in the game. Mm -hmm. That's the problem. We got to get in the game. So, you know, if I got to do all of the grassroots and go to your church and do science experiments and pull up to your house and do them and do them on Zoom, then that's what I'm going to do. Well, you're more than welcome to come back to the podcast and we can you show us what you, whatever, you, you know, sure. science that's stuff. Man, I love, I got a lot of stuff that I still would love. To man, I got so many experiments, man. Around. We going to be experimental. We fall asleep. Yeah. I got a bunch. Dude, I would, I would love it, man. It's, that would be great, a, a live experiment. And yeah. I would also say, as important as it is to be able to um, fund your lifestyle, yeah. I think the other the other piece of it is just the fact that you have a natural inclination to be successful to do something, right? Like, I know that a lot of people are money motivated. I get that. There's nothing wrong with that. That's awesome. But also just tapping into the fact that you can do this. You yeah, can do, you can do it, it. And, and and you can enjoy it, and just the same way that you could fill out an application at a fast food restaurant or um, doing something that's outdoors that you have an affinity or the strength to do, you can also jump into science. And I think for a lot of people, they think I'm not smart enough to do that. I don't have the money 
for college to do that. I'm not good in math, like you just alluded to. There's all these other barriers. It's not just I want to make a lot of money because a, a lot of people want to make a lot of money doing a lot of things right. and they can't rap, they can't ball, they don't have a model. <laughs> right. they, you know what I'm saying? Those, those are all the things that keep them from doing that, but they think that they can do something easy like do something that's illegal because that seems like quick money. I'm going to finesse my way into this or finesse my way into that. But I could also say science is not difficult. And that's the thing that I think needs to be pumped up. You do have to apply yourself. You do have to have discipline. You do have to have a level of consistency. But it's also letting them know that you can do it because, I mean, just to be real simple, like simple about it, whipping pots, putting baking soda and all the other shit together, that is chemistry. It is. Yeah. That's that's actually one of the things that intrigued me. I watched a relative of mine cook cocaine and turn it into crack. And I was like, bro, that's magic. Mm -hmm. I thought it was magic. How did you do that? Let's just talk about shit. That's that's what it's No, for real. How did you do that? That was amazing. And I went and put on my Instagram, I actually got the reaction to make crack cocaine on there. Mm-hmm. Because for a lot of people, it. that's what they're doing to get the money because they think that's the easiest, quickest thing that I can do that I'm good at. Right. And you that's can do so showing. many other things within the chemistry realm and have a patent for it. And it will not put you in prison for the rest of your life away from your family. And according right. to your video, I don't think they're using real Pyrex. <laughs> no, they're not. They're not using real pirates, man. It's hard to find that good stuff, man. That real pirates. Yeah. It's hard to find that that borosilicate, man. They got that tempered glass. We don't want that. We want the real stuff. Yeah. So if you can find some pyrex from the eighties, like in the in the early nineties and stuff, you can find it in thrift stores and stuff like that. And if it's in all caps, you know, you got some real Pyrex. And the crazy thing about that is, is that that stuff is reselling for so much more wow. because what they selling for Pyrex now is not Pyrex. That's tempered glass. Mm-hmm. You want the borosilicate. That was now, a very informative this. video, too. Yeah, yeah no problem. Yeah, yeah for yeah. sure. Yeah, I try to make, you know, I kind of slowed down on making the videos. I need to get back into it. Um, life definitely picked up. Um, and on, you're a, a chemist, on a business man. side of things, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's it, hard it to ask YouTube videos from a person that's, you know, in yeah. it. you know. So yeah, no, definitely. And so you know, the goal was to post as much as I could, not so much to be like Instagram famous. Mm, I just really wanted the exposure because, like, financially, I'm good, bro. I'm not really, you know, I'm not really here to do it for likes and stuff like that. That's, you know, I leave I'll that to other people and that's their lane. My lane is really chemistry, but I'm really trying to reach and touch as many kids because when I was growing up, science was Bill Nye. That's what science, that's what a scientist looked like. It was Bill Nye. And I'm not knocking Bill. He's not even a real scientist. He's in STEM, right? I think he got an a, a, a engineering degree, right? But I'm not trying to knock him at all, but it was like, wait a minute, bro. We really out here doing it. We publishing work and really in the science. But one of the biggest STEM educators in the in, in the world, definitely in America, is Bill Nye. So now visually, when you look at the aesthetics of that, right, you seeing older white guy in a lab coat. So when you think scientist, you never think of somebody that looked like me. I do. Well, yeah, I mean, you might, you know, and I appreciate that. I but do. for the most part, I'm talking about, you know, the main the main populace. And so that's why I pull up in J's and a sweatsuit, hat to the back and a lab coat. This is what a scientist look like. Don't stereotype us. We look all different kind of ways. No, not at all. Because my scientists look like Miss Gloria Spann from Jackson, Mississippi. You look like somebody's mama. Well, yeah. she was somebody mama. Yeah. She didn't cut no corners and you would be in trouble if you did not finish your science homework. If your science project wasn't right, you was getting told off in front of the whole class and you was embarrassed. Mr. Theophilus <laughs> King who would jump on top of the desk and tell you if you didn't know the covalent bonds and the periodic yeah. tables, you wasn't yeah. right and you thought you was going to go out and have fun. I, I mean, I had real 
Kwame, you yeah. you know how we got down. We have real science teachers that look yeah. like us. They might have been teachers. Not at Jackson State. Not, the, not my organic chemistry teacher. No, I don't know. I'm, talking, other I'm ones, actually though, yeah. talking about in Jackson. <laughs> in Jim Hill. In high yeah. school. Yeah, you know yeah. what I'm saying? But prior to that, no, none of my science teachers looked like me. And none of them cared whether I got it or didn't. Yeah. But starting in the 10th grade, every scientist that I came into contact with looked just like me. And they were serious about us getting our education. Nine times out of 10, they were graduates from HBCUs and they held us to a high standard. And if we didn't meet that standard, then we could not come in their class. And even if there was a bomb threat, we had to come back and have our <laughs> after the bomb threat. Bomb threat or not, you're going to get this science. That's so it's I just like, you. that's it. It's oh, man. And now have a peer. And I have a, a few friends that are in your position that, that have taken the baton and ran with it. But it's just oh. unfortunate that we don't see you guys on a regular. You know what I'm saying? It takes a podcast like this. And I'm so thankful for these two that yeah. have this platform. But if you Google a scientist that has uh -huh. nanocellular whatever polymer like i can't even say all this stuff i, I gotta reread it reread I, I still don't know half of what you're talking about but that's not what they're gonna see like when we talk about when they see us this is right, how right. they see us but this is not what's promoted about us you know we have a cellist we have a computer scientist we have a social scientist we have a chemical patent holding tri alumnus <laughs> from tuskegee like this is just in this little small podcast, but we Before are this, not right. to, to see that on, the, and and there's so many more. And so when you're talking about what you present to the to the kids, I just want to make sure, even if it's just some quick sound bites, as we have this conversation that we can put out there, because to Luan's point, it's not a lot of black women in these classes no. that she went to school with that she was able to see herself represented. Yeah. The same with me. I was always one of a few, if not the only one. And and the other, the flip side to that is they try to make you feel like- And I grew up playing the cello. You know, it's like you're a little orchestra. token, like you made it. <laughs> and, and that's not what we want yes. either. Yes. You know what I'm saying? It's like, okay, I'm gonna hoard all the knowledge. You made it, you're a good one. You're the good black. No, we want to- push in the door and have all of us in. Right. Yeah. No, you, you preaching. <laughs> I mean, everything you said was facts. I, I just think that, um, you know, we can eventually get that reach. You know, that's what it's all about. I mean, <clears throat> have you been on a, a couple of podcasts? Yeah, I've been on a few. Um, so I've been on some in America and even some in the UK. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll shoot them to you uh, so you can, you know, listen to them or whatever. I was on one about the innovation. It was really good. It was kind of short. But we got a uh, breakfast club. Never been on that. Okay. We, Are you talking about like. I'm talking about the breakfast club. Big boy podcast. <laughs> nah, nah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So. Uh, you definitely, uh, uh, you definitely. Yeah. They would love to talk. I, I know you would love to talk to you. I think they'd love to talk to you as well. Yeah, a, a colleague of mine, uh, Jessica Clements, um, Dr. Jess, ask Dr. Jess, you know, she's the one who went to, um, she got her MD from Cornell. We went to Tuskegee together, so we're really good friends. Um, and so she's been on there a couple of times, I think. So she's been, you know, uh, a proponent of mental health awareness and stuff like that. So, you know, um, she, she's been doing her thing. And uh, I'm trying to think, do I know anybody else that's been on there? But, I, you know, in a few years that I was at Tuskegee, we've had some pretty notable young alumni come up out of there and, you know, pretty much do their thing. I mean, you know, um, so that's been a blessing for sure. Uh, I So I know a few people that know a few people. I don't really know all of these people, but I know, you know, who I went to school with and, and they know a lot of people and they got a pretty decent network and stuff like that. But um, I know I, I just wanted 
I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go, mm-hmm. ahead. go ahead. No, go ahead. No, no, no. It's all good. I was just going to say, I just wanted to say, like, I think that um, a lot of people don't know about us because a lot of people don't know about scientists as a whole. I don't even really think it's like um, they're trying to hold the black scientists back. I mean, it's just, you know, those three scientists that I talked about that own heritage, you, you never heard of them either, you know, or, you know, the guy who helped fund my entire PhD was a, 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 a scientist out of um, University of Wisconsin. And he fixed, I don't know if you remember when the Galaxy Note was blowing up. When, remember when those things were exploding? Yeah. The Samsung Note? Yeah. yeah. So he was the one who actually fixed that. I know him personally, uh, um, but you heard it stop, you know. I notice I haven't been getting the phone calls. They, I haven't been getting the phone calls about my car insurance. You know anything about, oh, about man. who might have fixed that? Man, that car, that thing is hell. I don't, man, I get those calls every day, bro. Okay. But no, I mean. <laughs> no, I'm serious. Or your your factory warranty right. is getting ready to it's just expire. As, up. Just blowing oh, up. Yeah. yeah, I forgot about yeah. that. Nah, but nah, he he definitely um, you know, did his thing with that, and and you know he got a government contract out of that. Nobody's ever heard of this guy. Like I knew him, and I didn't even know he had done that. I knew him and didn't know he had done that until one day he was giving an intellectual property talk, and I was like, wait a minute, you did what? And like he, they flew him to Japan and made him a citizen of Tokyo or something like that. And, you know, he got a government contract because those batteries, that battery technology was also used in all of the military helicopters in the army and stuff. And, and he got a like, what, you know, when so. was, when, um, as far as the, I guess the experiment with, um, or your patent with the, di- um, biodegradable plastic, plastic, mm-hmm. When was that information? Was that ever released? Because I feel like I yeah. heard about that a long time yeah, ago. Yeah, it was. So, so that's how um, I feel right now. Like I heard about that, and I'm actually meeting the person that actually did that. And that's yeah, it came out a few times. Uh, yeah. So it's I've been in publications, Journal for Blacks in Higher Education, yeah. Plastic Insights. Uh, I was on a television show called Emerald Planet. Um, yeah. On a couple of things in the UK. Forgot the name, all that stuff. I'll, 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 I can send amazing, it to you. I mean, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it got some. Listen, I, I'd be lying if I said it didn't get any notoriety. I know. I, like I said, I, I th- I'm positive. I've I've heard about it. Yeah, yeah. it definitely yeah. got some notoriety. But I mean, it's one of those things where it's if, like if it's not on TV or you know or you know the news or something like that, it's kind of just like yo gotcha. five seconds of fame or whatever, and then it's over. You know, if you even get that as a scientist, because what I got, that exposure was like uncommon. You know what I mean? Like we typically don't get that kind of even if you've done something big, you typically don't get that. Wow. You know what I'm saying? So yeah, I was in I a care bunch about of- the environment. So it, it stuck with me. You know, it's something that I'm always thinking of. living in L.A. We see trash everywhere and it's just everywhere. Man, that sticks LA with me. Is rough. Even from the ocean, we snorkel yeah. and stuff like that. So even just to see videos of what yeah. the plastic and just period, you know, and yeah. even like garment district is just made of so much stuff. You ride by the stores and I just see plastic and stuff. And I'm, even yeah, the clothes, so, the clothes are made out of plastics. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. Listen, man. So I know that I, that right now me is like, okay, ocean. at least that part of science. I remember in that moment, I felt like a piece of hope to be like, okay, you know, at least they're going to start eating plastic. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> That no. part of science is like, yes, that's good. At least the so plastic. So look, my out. dissertation work, man, um, the, the Kaiser Foundation said by 2050, there'll be more plastic in the world's ocean than fish by weight. Yeah. Mm. Wrap your mind around that, bro. That's yeah. crazy. Yeah. More I- plastic in the ocean than fish by weight? Bro, that's crazy. And right now in in the Pacific Ocean, they have what they call the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. I don't know if you guys heard of that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Bro, this is the fundamental basis to my research. This is the grand challenge that we were trying to, like, mitigate. Yeah. Bro, this thing's out there twice the size of Texas. Just a big trash island. Look it up. Google it. I'm not even kidding. Like, that's not even a hyperbole. It's, it's the currents is, like, stirring the trash and, you know, 
and it's getting trapped. Mm. You know, that Pacific current is just getting trapped out there. And it's, you know, it's not like a lot of it is together, but then now you have like these garbage islands where um, you got birds and stuff like albatross and all these different types of birds and stuff, right? And they're like eating the plastic because it's shiny and it's, you know, it's appealing to the eyes. So they think it's like fish or whatever. So they eating it. And so then they're finding the birds to cease. And when they cut them open, they're full of plastic, no food. Mm. They're like starving to death, bro. Literally. I mean, and man. can't, can't digest the plastic either. Probably. Yeah. If I had a presentation, yeah, I probably need to go on Joe Rogan and talk about this. Cause that he's too. Like, yeah. Yes. Yeah, and let's pull yes, it up. that's, <laughs> Like I said, some of that, the people right? that they really want to see Joe Rogan talk to, that's you. Yeah. Yeah. And we, yeah. like I said, oh. I'm so, man, I'm so happy to sit here and talk to you right now. And I, I really, like I said, I want to have you, you got to come back again because. Yeah, I'll come he, back as many I want to talk about me, um, sure. uh, uh, ice and, you know, Antarctica, so even since we're talking about water or just whatever that what's in the water and places like that or. Yeah, yeah man, listen, from. Some people believe this whole global warming thing. You have some scientists that believe global warming isn't real. That the world is just going through its warming and cooling natural phases. And then you have some that say, yeah, but it's the rate at which we're warming, which, you know, gives it the, that we're doing this greenhouse gases, methane, carbon dioxide stuff. So I actually also have carbon capture technology too, but, um, you know, I think that uh, I think that where we are on this planet, we they trying to they they want an excuse to leave here and go somewhere else anyway, or at least you know make us I mean? think that. I don't know if you remember the Mars One project, but they were talking about one way astronauts. They, they want an excuse to leave here and go and be interstellar. You know, they want to be interstellar beings. They want to live on multiple planets at the same time. 100%. Like, that's, that's getting ready to happen, man. Like that's in our lifetime. Yeah. That's happening in our lifetime. They're, they're already um, talking about putting nuclear outposts on the moon so that you can have nuclear power. They're trying to power the moon up. Yeah, it's a bunch That's of stuff. That's a whole that, other man. conversation in itself. I'm like, man, but doesn't yeah, the moon I mean, have, I mean, like, emit, the moon emits light or something yeah. like that, doesn't it? What was that? Doesn't the moon emit its own power or emits light? Reflects. Ref uh, it's reflects. Mo it's, yeah, so lunar regolith is mostly silicate, so it reflects light from the sun. It's, it doesn't actually make its own light. Okay. But... I mean, that's a lot. That, but, yeah, yeah. I'm gonna make yeah. a list of stuff that that we can talk about because I've never, yeah. known, I've never known, a, of course, a scientist that I've had access to to ask questions. And we, I'm grateful I'm for done. this podcast. Yeah. So all of all my research, all my thermal studies, I did at NASA at Rest on Arsenal in Huntsville, Alabama. So I spent a pretty good amount of time there doing research. I don't work for NASA, but I've, I've been in their research facilities doing work a bunch. They're nice. <laughs> they are nice, bro. <laughs> man, they got that state of the art stuff, man. It's not like what you would see at the typical HBCU. They are nice. That's you know, and that's that's another thing that I do. I, you know, I get kids and um, well, college students, and I send them there to do research to NASA and stuff with our collaborators. Okay. Send them there for the summer and, you know, stuff like that and let them get paid for it. That's yeah, awesome. I got, I I got awesome. one one more question. I know we're we're kind of getting close to wrapping up, but I wanted yeah. to know what, if any, experience you have with the McNair Scholars. So I haven't worked with the McNair Scholars at all. Um, Because you mentioned yeah. NASA and I know, yeah. you know, they have that connection with McNair as well, but... Um, I just wondered if you had had any, any. No, no, for sure. No, I don't have yeah. any experience with them. I worked directly with um, NASA. So um, when I was in graduate school, I needed to do thermal studies, you know, TGA and stuff like that and uh, DSC. And I needed to actually 
we had those instruments there, but I was trying to expound upon the breadth of my thermal uh, technical skills. So I went to NASA and uh, they, they accepted me there and I did a bunch of work there and it was great. They worked the heck out of me, <laughs> but it was a great experience. Yeah. I guess uh, before we get ready to close out, um, what is the basic shift for like a chemist? What what do you mean when you say basic shift? What do you mean? Like your work day? What do you you like many, a work day? What hours? Is a, a, a yeah, you day? like uh, fifteen hours, eight Ooh. hours, or you know? So it could be a grind, man. It really depends on your passion. So now you have some people that work your typical work life balance type situation where they they put in a forty a week and they done, and then you have some who live the life of opulence, living the lab, and it's just like. You know, yeah. Um, right now I'm in grind mode. So my days are 12 and 14 hours. Um, but I'm trying to do some things that have never been done before. So I'm in an uncharted territory myself. Right. But um, it's really whatever you make it. It depends on what track. If you do academia and you're teaching, you know, you're probably looking at a six to seven hour day, depending on what you're trying to do in academia. Are you just working to get a check? Are you trying to get tenure? You know, are you trying to publish? Like, what? Are, what is it? What's your goal there? You know what I'm saying? But um, it really depends on your own ambition. You can really get whatever you want. The beauty of what we do is that our schedules are completely flexible. So, like, you know, today I woke up at 10 o'clock. Okay. But once I got going, I was going nonstop. <laughs> And it's 10 o'clock now or at 10, 10 30 here still okay. going. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So it just, it just really depends, you know? Definitely. We appreciate um, the two hours you, out of your long shift today. Um, That's it's, all good, man. Anytime. Man, it's an absolute honor talking to you, man. You are a superhero Pleasure's in all our mine. world, Thank man. God mode, man. Chemistry guy, Dr. White. <laughs> we appreciate you, my friend. And Thanks, man. Thanks I, for like having I said, me. I'm really looking forward to the. I gotta, like I said, I'm gonna have you back. I gotta have you back. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, for sure. And for sure. I'll come I, back whenever. Um, you just let me know. We can pick some topics and stuff you guys want to go over. We can talk about it. Next week, um, we're talking about vibranium. No. Uh, just, vibranium. I'm just kidding. Vibranium. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we're definitely man. Got to make some list of some super cool stuff because we're outdoor people. I've yeah, I've had too. questions like I've I got questions and you seem like yeah you answered some questions. So nature yeah. is dope, bro. It's dope, and it you know what what we're looking at is like you know thousands upon millions of years of evolution of doing things really efficiently to mm-hmm. to work really yeah. efficiently. Nature is how we. It's how I did everything. Everything I did. Nanocellulose comes from plants. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Cellulose comes from plants. So, you know, everything we do is looking at nature. It's the George Washington Carver in me. Now, when they say plant-based <laughs> products, do they mean like real plants or the like the plant, the building plant? Yeah, I don't really. No, they, they talking about real plants. <laughs> okay. But I don't know how I feel about <laughs> Hey, that's a good question, and that's definitely something that we need to add to the part two as far as yes. having yeah, it. Because sure. that, cause that can go in so many – I'm I'm glad you said that, Kwame, for real, because, yeah. You I, see, I, I can go on for days too. with the questions. You know, they'll <laughs> pop out. Like, I got them way. You know, I wanted that, too. Okay. Write them down, bro. Yeah. Because, yeah. yeah, like, that. plants, we're not supposed to eat every plant. So people be like, yeah, let's go uh, vegan. Mm. They have hormone disruptors, endocrine disruptors that, mm-hmm. you know, will mess you up. I think it was a uh, 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 Percy L. Julian, Dr. Percy L. Julian, who converted plant steroids to uh, st- sterols to human growth hormones or human hormones. Right. Literally how we got birth control. How does this guy not win a Nobel Prize for that black guy mm-hmm. from Montgomery, Alabama? Wow. Organic chemist converts plant sterols to estradiol, bro. And that's how we got birth control to human to human hormones. I mean, listen. Yeah, we're amazing, man. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. So like 
he takes it through a synthesis and does this, and now literally how we got birth control pills. So wait, literally. are there plants that we eat um, on a regular basis that are endocrine disruptors? Oh yeah. Oh, okay. oh yeah, there's a ton. Yeah, we're gonna have to do a whole thing on yeah. nutrition. And yeah, nutrition because stuff. yeah, some of the stuff that we eat, the body turns and converts things into other things. Mm. You know, so um, the biochemist in me will be like, okay, it's the Krebs cycle, right? So when you look at the citric acid cycle, or some might call it the carboxylic acid cycle, or the or Krebs for short, um, food goes in. And every time you turn the wheel, you get two electrons worth of energy, right? And these wheels are constantly turning, turning, turning. But you have these enzymes in there that are breaking these things down to um, get energy. So you're forming bonds and breaking bonds. And that's how we get the energy at the cellular level. You know what I'm saying? They, it's called phosphorylation, um, where they add these phosphate groups and stuff on there. But that's a whole nother yeah, that's a lot right yeah. there. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> and just talking about how we like eat, and like generate energy. You know what I'm saying? I want to do a collaboration with my cousin Jason so we can put that in a, a book. I don't know if that'll nerd people out, but we should put it in there anyway. I oh, know, man. We, yeah. It, it, See, I'm rocking a PHL. It's yeah. Totally- I got that <laughs> shirt. Yeah. This, this shirt is one of the best shirts. I'm yeah, it you. is. I ain't going to lie. It is fire. Yeah, I like the lightning most. It's like, hey, cuz, get the Laker colors out there. Yeah. Bam, yeah. But it's my favorite. um, It's one of my favorites too. I wanted to to say before we wrapped up, I know I said that before and then we keep jumping in, but it's just a wealth of information. And the three of us are pumped about being able to have (laughs) trying to type it in or watch a video. We got you right here in front of us. Talk to our listeners about where they can go to find out more information, connect with you, engage with you, follow you, find your uh, book. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. Book you out. <laughs> so, maybe sit in on one of your classes, you know, how can they have more interaction with you? So I'm looking to put together one of those, uh, what do they call it? Uh, Patreons. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, I, I don't want to. I don't want people to have to pay though. So maybe I'll mm-hmm. do like a. You can do a free access on. You can. Control. Yeah, like a free access Patreon or something. Yeah, mm-hmm. I was looking to do like some of the, like those platforms where, you know, you could do like a Q and A at the end and just you know maybe there's a lesson on something that just kind of like you know some field of chemistry and then just kind of like educate the main public on it and stuff like that. So I'm looking to do something like that. But right now I have Instagram, right? So I'm under the chemist, D-A underscore chemist, C-H-E-M-I-S-T. So at the chemist, D-A underscore C-H-E-M-I-S-T. Um, and I'm um, on Twitter as well. So the chem first, right? So the chemist wasn't available. So I used instead of an I, it's a one. So um, the chem first. And then uh, I would say they could follow me on Facebook, but I'm at my 5,000 person limit. So, <laughs> yeah, can't add anybody. Are you on LinkedIn? Yeah, I'm on LinkedIn. Donald White, you can find me. Donald White, PhD. Yep, you can find me on LinkedIn. Um, you know, I try to do um, talks on my research. Like I gave a talk earlier today on my research at Texas Southern. Um, I've done a bunch of talks to other different places. <clears throat> but yeah, tell them to hop on, reach out, shoot me a DM. I'll more than likely hit you right back because I'm always on there doing something or posting something. Or sometimes I go live on there to just talk about current events, like things that are happening in the sciences or think, you know, like when COVID was big, um, I did a lot of that. Um, I did a lot of teaching, teaching people how to read the clinical trials and the, and the papers and stuff like that so they can make informed decisions. Okay. Um, so I do a lot of that kind of stuff. You know, we we actually took a class called literature review in graduate school that teaches us how to read the papers. So I took that same information and, you know, I started educating the, you know, the, the population. So I got videos on my IG about that as well, too. So you can go check those out as well. Okay. okay. So you, what you think about having the lab coat on for the next interview? 
<laughs> it, it's right over here. I mean, I just uh, I just left the lab actually, so I was in there tutoring, and before that, I was uh, doing a lab. But um, yeah, I throw the lab coat on and smear a little blood, fake blood over on it, like this. <laughs> <laughs> it's just slaughtered. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But it's been yeah. uh, man, an a awesome, awesome you yeah, know, conversation, no, it was great, man. man. You guys got great energy, man. I've, the prep, the pleasure was all mine. I've learned a lot, you know. Yeah. And I look forward to learning even more. I look forward to yeah. having, getting a hold of you. Likewise. Um, looking forward to the book as well. I love water. I'm a water scientist. Yeah, no, I'm going to shoot you one. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. Maybe, uh, so what I could do is I could shoot you a book and some other little keepsake things, magnets and stickers and socks and all that crap. And then um, I can also, uh, we could set up a time. We could do it, maybe do one or two of the experiments live on your podcast, bro. Yes. That would be great. I love that. Yeah, and I, yeah. I had a, a idea when I was in Georgia when we used to print shirts. So we had a printer. And I remember when I saw it in your book, it reminded me of because my vet, one of my vets actually had me print the shirt for him. And it was I had the periodic table upside down to where mm-hmm. if the kid had it on, they could look at the periodic shirt. You know, that's pretty dope. Right actually. There. So I want yeah, to like that. that. I to share that with you. <laughs> yeah. All right. Appreciate it. <laughs> like I'm going to add that to my to my merch. I got to get my merch game up, man. It's just a lot. Like I'm a I'm a scientist for real. It's not like, you know. Um, you know, I'm in the lab every day, bro. Like, it's not like a play thing with me. Um, Ooh, you know what would be good? Maybe you guys can come out and we can shoot the podcast from the lab one day. Yeah, because we are yeah. mobile. So, yeah. yeah. You guys we'll are mobile? That. That'll be fire. Yeah. We could. We, we should do it from there. I would love that. Yeah. Maybe the second one or the third one. And all yeah. three of y'all come and, um, you know, I can just kind of like, you know, take y'all around. We could do a day in a life or something. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I'm just great, throwing out bro. ideas. We, really, but we would fun. love to do that, man. Yeah. Yeah. Love that'd to be fire, that, bro. Um, Cause man, you're an amazing guy, bro. Trust me. This to yeah, talk no, to Kim cool, receiver, just to, you answered all of our questions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, uh, I tried. That's, you know, yeah, man. We have a lot of questions like that. So, no, man, it's all good, man. We appreciate Just you even sharing. Get a running your, list, man. We'll knock them out. The, yeah. you, you know, well, we're definitely gonna have to send you some crystals to yes. prepare for yourself and see what we're talking yes. about. Yeah, yeah for sure. The, to, you can see That's the difference. With in, me, man. Uh, so maybe uh, you know what I can do is um, you send me the crystals. I'll break them and uh, break a couple of them if you don't mind, and uh, give you guys some electron microscope images of them and stuff. Oh, that's so, nice. so cool. Stuff like that. Send it back to you. Yeah, that's I awesome. can do that. Yeah, uh, cool. Shoot them to me, and I, you know, I'll break them and let you guys see what you got. Okay. That's okay. cool. Yeah, that'll be awesome. It'll be cool. Something, you know. Yeah. There's yeah. all kind of stuff we could do, man. I'm, I'm a chemist. Like I said, we'll, I'm a chemist. We'll send you some for testing, and we'll send you some for, you know, Breaking. your shelf, your cabinet. <laughs> yeah. All right, cool. For, yeah, some cool, for breaking and some for yeah for the the show. Some to yeah. keep, some to play with. Yeah, yeah. You, no, you'll you. yeah you'll see the difference. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and for the listeners, all of um, Doctor White's information will be in the description, so you don't have to worry about you know, writing <laughs> yep. it down. Um, and for our podcast, oh, I guess before we close out. Um, I want to say thank you um, thank to you. Dr. Thank White you. and Mercedes uh, thank for you, Mercedes. joining thank us. You. and Thank having you for this. having me, okay, Dr. Dr. White, because, Don, uh, it's, it's been a pleasure, and I know this is a special day for you, so I appreciate you taking the time out, and I know that it's a, it's a real memorial. You know what I'm saying? You walking in your ancestors' light and be able to, have you on this day is is major. So thank you for taking the time on February 9th to honor him and you. Thank you so much. Thank you. You all have a good night, I guess. Um, You got control of it, so y'all can hang out whenever you want. Okay, and I guess you can uh, find us at americangypsy.com and um, also have some music at classic, K-L-A-C-C-I-K, C-A-R-P-E-N-T-A. Links will be in the description. And then we have consistent self-improvement merch at luamli.com and crystals, bearite crystals at book a bearite on Etsy. Thank you again to everybody. Thank you again, Dr. Wright and Mercedes. And Dr. White, sorry. And Mercedes. And peace. Yes.
Peace. Yeah.